morning, Central family and friends. Today's the last day for the summer cereal drive. This great event helps feed kids throughout the summer who usually eat at school. You can help us by simply purchasing cereal and donating it in the designated boxes or by donating money for the summer cereal drive. Donating just $1 buys one box of cereal. Thanks so much for your generosity to help feed kids around our city. If you're new to Central, we want to encourage you to fill out a Connect card that's located in the seat back in front of you. Then you can drop it off in the connection box located throughout the building. Thanks so much for worshiping with us today. Now join us as we praise our great God today at Central. to see you. If you're joining us in Lime Street, we're glad to have you here too. Let's all stand up and worship our great God, for He has done great things. Amen. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. Celebrate those great things today. He's been faithful. He's been faithful through every storm. He'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen.
great things. Amen. And the greatest of things is when death was arrested and our new lives began. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to Yeah. 
Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful that he arrested death and stopped it? Listen to Ephesians chapter 2. It says, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. I am thankful today for the grace of our God that saves us. We are thankful you have joined us today. If you're joining us online, we welcome you as well. We hope all of you will just join in, sing together, and be changed by the preaching of God's word today. Let's pray together and we'll continue to worship. God, it is good to be with your people in your house today. We thank you for your promises. Thank you that we can trust in you and that when we come to you, you will give us new life. You will give us salvation by your grace. We thank you for that today. May your grace pour over the life of every person here. And if there's someone here who has never experienced your grace for salvation, would they turn to Christ today? Draw them to yourself. We'll be careful to give Christ all the praise and all the glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's continue our praises forever to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died.
Hallelujah. Let's continue to sing about God's praises. In Christ alone we stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What hearts of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. Striving seas, my comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love. Says, scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i gift of love that was on that Friday, but it doesn't stop there, amen? Sunday morning's coming, the best news. There in the ground his body lay, light of the dark, night dark, this lane, then bursting forth in glorious
finished up this morning by singing Amazing Grace. Ladies, lead us. Welcome. Good to see you today. Uh, I'm Mike Leffler. Most of you know me if you're here, our guest today. I'm Associate Pastor of Church Ministries, and I'm glad to be here with you preaching. And Brother Don is still away from us. Uh, he has gone through a heart surgery, and he's in recovery, and he's 
Uh, actually at rehab now, doing well. In fact, he texted me a little bit ago. So uh, I just, I'm thankful that he's feeling better. He wanted me to let all of you know that he loves you and he's praying for us today. Amen. And uh, he hopes to be back with us in a, a few weeks or so. So just turn in your Bibles today to Philippians chapter one. Uh, Bart, thank you and the choir and the orchestra for leading us in worship thus far. And we're going to continue our worship. Bart said a minute ago something when he introduced the last song. We're going to finish up today. And I said, hold on there. I'm about to just get started. Okay. And I, w I want you to understand that worship doesn't end when the music ends. We worship around the word of God. And, and that's what the preaching of the word is. It's, it's the worship of God. And Bart knows that. I'm just teasing with him. I was just sitting there thinking, well, do I get to go home now or am I supposed to preach? But you know I'm going to preach. So I'm glad to be here with you today. I love y'all and I thank you. I hope you have your Bible. If you don't, you'll follow along with us. Uh, a few weeks ago, I preached on the woman at the well and we used as the subject title of that message, the gospel in life. How the gospel of Jesus Christ impacts us as we go through life. Now, Jesus conversed with the woman at the well, and she came to a full saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw her conversion experience. And so the gospel had impacted her life. We're going to kind of pick up on that. We're going to move from the gospels to one of the New Testament epistles, this little book of Philippians. And we're going to see how the gospel is on the move, how the gospel continues to move. And so we see this and we understand that there had been many years that had advanced. In fact, when we read this letter, and I'm going to do a little background for us in a minute from Acts chapter 16, based on this letter and the verses that are before us today, we're going to see that this letter, Paul was writing back to the church at Philippi that he had originally helped plant that church and start that church 10 years earlier. And so maybe that'll help you just have some context of this passage today. So read with me in Philippians 1. You follow along, and I'll read these verses that are our text today. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. For it is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of the grace both in the imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless in the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it became known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that mine imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word that you've entrusted into our care. And Lord, I would pray today that you would give us ears to listen, and you would help us to realize as we study your word that it's an opportunity for us to sit at your feet today and hear what you have to say to us. 
And so, Father, I pray you would bless the ministry of your word this hour into our lives individually and corporately as a church family. And help us, Lord, to look to you for insight and direction and how you are calling us to live this life that is the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So as we look at this passage of scripture together, the gospel is on the move. Now, honestly, the the title for this message comes from verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, and this week when I preached this, this passage just jumped out at me when I studied it. That what has happened to me? Wonder what has happened to you this week, the past weeks, the past month. No matter what has happened to us in life, the good, the not so good, the bad, and perhaps even the ugly. God says no matter what has happened to us, has really served, and it should serve, to advance the gospel. The gospel should always be on the move in our lives, working in us and through us. The gospel has to work in us to help us grow spiritually, not just at salvation, but through your growing in knowledge and God's grace, as he says, as Peter says in his letter. The gospel has to do a stirring work in your life before it can do the fulfilling work through your life. And it seems like some of us are stuck. We're stagnant. We remember the time when we got saved, but there's not been much fruit There's not been much spiritual life that has flowed and that's moving in our lives as we continue to want to bring honor and glory to our Lord and follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when we look at this passage, we're going to see that the gospel is on the move. He says in verse 1 that I read to you, Paul and Timothy, they're servants of Christ Jesus to the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the overseers and deacons. This was an organized church. It's 10 years old. They even had pastors, overseers, and deacons. Amen? I thank God for our deacons. Some of you may not know them. I hope you'll get to know them. Our deacons are here to serve you and share the gospel. You know most of your pastors. These are the spiritual leaders in the church. So this church was organized and God was doing a a work in and through them. And when Paul thought back, he said, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all. It says, making my prayer with joy for your partnership in the gospel. Now look what he says, from the first day until now. So turn with me to Acts 16. And let me show you real quick the first day. 10 years earlier. So Paul wanted to go spread the gospel. He had finished his first missionary journey. Uh, He had separated at that time from Barnabas. And now Paul had taken Silas on as a partner. Uh, Him and Barnabas had a little disagreement over a young man named John Mark. That's another message, but it's a beautiful story. Because later in Paul's life, the very last letter he wrote, he said, bring John Mark. I want to see him again. He's profitable for me for ministry. And because of Barnabas' investment in John Mark, we have a gospel today in our Bibles called the Gospel of Mark. Barnabas didn't give up on John Mark. And then Paul, he's looking for him another John Mark, and I like that. And so we're told in Acts chapter 16 that there was a disciple there in verse 1 named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But her father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brothers in Lystria and Iconium. And so Paul, he wanted to take Timothy with him. 
I wonder if you've got someone in your life that you've invested in and mentored and discipled. This, one, this relationship was 10 years old now. And now Paul and Timothy are in Rome. And Paul's in a Roman jail. And Timothy's there helping him advance the gospel. It's that same Timothy. Well, there they were. They were in Philippi for the very first time. Timothy had just joined them. And it says on down, Paul was trying to figure out where he was going to go next. In verse 9, a vision appeared to Paul at night, and a man of Macedonia was standing there saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. I love that. I love the ministry of helps. It's a spiritual ministry, spiritual gift mentioned in 1 Corinthians. I told you that Jesus asked the woman at the well for help when he simply said, give me a drink of water. And now we have some believers in Macedonia asking Paul and the missionaries for some help. We should be humble and vulnerable and ask others for help when we really need it. Because God had given, they were praying to God first and foremost, asking God to help us, send someone to us. And if you're here today and you're searching and seeking for spiritual truth, for a deeper understanding of what it means to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I ask you to pray and ask God to send you some help. And I ask you also not only to pray and ask God to send you some help, but be open to the help that this church or some caring Christian friend around you would also be able to give you. God responds to the prayers of people. And so they asked for help and Paul said, I'm going there. And he took off and I'm just paraphrasing. And it says, they sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us, that's at the end of verse 10, to preach the gospel to them. Amen and amen. That's how the gospel was on the move. It was moving. But we see in this first section of scripture, as Paul writes this letter 10 years later, back to this same church, that the gospel had moved first and foremost in their lives before it could move through their lives. There were three converts here, and we won't have time to cover all of the three converts in Acts chapter 16. But the first convert is mentioned in verse 14. There was a woman there named Lydia from the city of Thyatira. She was a seller of purple goods. And she heard the word of God, and she trusted in God, and many of her household with her. And then the next convert in verse 16 was a slave girl who was, had the spirit of divination and she brought her owners much gain by fortune telling. And then the third one was this jailer, this Roman guard who had entrusted Paul and Silas into the prison because not only were they in prison in Rome, this church got founded and planted because they had got thrown in jail in Philippi. They didn't like these guys, what they were preaching and teaching. And so here they are in jail at Philippi, and this jailer is about to pull out his sword and kill himself because he thinks all the prisoners have escaped. And Paul says, do yourself no harm. We are all here. And the jailer came and fell down in front of him and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And that's how the gospel got planted in this little town of Philippi. Three unusual converts. Sometimes I refer to them kind of humorously as I was studying this years ago. You had a purple seller, you had a fortune teller, and you had a mean jailer. And that just reminds every one of us that God saves diversity across anybody. No matter what your background is, where you've been, what you've done, Jesus saves. And he wants to save you. The gospel has to be formulated in your life. And so Paul was talking about that. Now back to Philippians chapter 1. So I gave you the introduction just based on that passage that I read to you from the first day until now. And this is what he says as the gospel is formulated in verse 6. He says, and I am sure of this, that he who has begun a work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. The same God who saved you wants to sanctify you and wants to secure you and wants to satisfy you and wants to finish his work in and through you. 
So don't give up on Jesus and don't grow cold on Jesus. You got to seek Jesus and grow in God's grace and knowledge just like you did the moment you got saved. Some of you got on that salvation bus and you just went to sleep on the back seat. And it's time for you to get back up and get up there and tell the driver, say, get out. I want to drive with you. I want to see this gospel continue to advance in my life and through my life. See, the work that God's talking about there in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 is the work of your sanctification. Now, that's a big theological word, but it simply means you becoming more like Jesus Christ. God has set you apart because now you are a child of God. And because you're a child of God and you said in your original salvation, you may not have said this, but if you were really saved, this is what you should be thinking now. I want to follow Jesus. I'm a Christ follower. And we have too many people in our church today who are not allowing the gospel to be on the move in their lives because they've just gotten cold and complacent and they've drifted. And God says here, this is a work that he begun in us. We didn't do it. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of works that you've done. It is the gift of God. That's what his word tells us. And God is working in your life and he wants to work through your life. And God wants you to grow in God's grace and God's knowledge, the way Peter says in his letter. And so you've got to be open to all that God wants to do in and through you. So ask yourself this question. What has God done in my life lately? Where's the spiritual formation coming from? Spiritual formation is a term that seminaries started using in Bible colleges that they were giving incoming students to make sure they had a true relationship with Jesus Christ. When I was in seminary, they first called it the Holy Spirit and the devotional life. See, if you don't have a devotional life, then you're really not following Jesus. Not the way you should be or could be. Spiritual formation is that process of you growing in your discipleship. You know, when I got saved many, many years ago, I was 22 years old, and as I shared with the church, my formation of my life happened when I was kind of running from God. And one day I was running from God, but God had other plans, and I ran right into a church service to make my mama happy. And I got saved that day. And everything changed. Everybody thought I'd lost my mind. One of my closest friends at that time, who's now passed from this life, said to me, are you sure you know what you're doing? And I said, I know more now than I've ever known before. Do you think anybody asked that lady who was full of demonic activity, who was bringing her owners much money from telling other people's fortune, do you think they ask her, are you sure you know what you're doing? How about that old jailer? Are you sure you know what you're doing? They all knew what they were doing. Why? Because they had had an encounter with the risen and resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus changes our lives. That's the gospel. It's not just saying some little prayer. And then years later, somebody asked you, you're saved. You said, yeah, I said, that, I said that prayer. Well, if that prayer that you prayed has made you live a life that has nothing to do with God, then you better wonder if you really got saved with that prayer. Because when you really get saved, God changes your life. He comes into you. He gives you a new direction and a new purpose and God is wanting you to do a work for him the way this church at Philippi was. There has to be a spiritual formation. And the same God who began that work wants to continue it until the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 6 in your text. So don't give up. And don't throw in the towel. And if you're uncertain, get back on the gospel bus. Amen. Amen. 
There was an old preacher I used to listen to. In fact, I still do sometimes, J. Vernon McGee. Some of you older people in here, or more mature people, I should say, you've heard of J. Vernon McGee. And he preached through the Bible his entire life out in California, a Presbyterian minister. And he invites you every day when you listen to him teach to get on the gospel bus. And I'm inviting you today to get on the gospel bus and let Jesus be the one who leads you. So we see the spiritual formation that takes place. And then we see that the gospel moves in our life through fellowship, the fellowship of the gospel, not just the formation. And this is in verses seven through 10. He says, it's right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart and you're partakers with me of grace. You need to underline that word grace. You're partakers with me of grace. We just sung about amazing grace. And I don't think we really realize how amazing God's grace really is. It's a grace that saves us. It's a grace that holds on to us. It's a grace that changes us. It's a grace that pushes us out of our comfort zone to do something bold for Jesus Christ. It's a grace that changes your perspective on life. And God told this, I mean, Paul told this church in this thank you note he was writing them. He said, you are partakers with me of God's grace. Even while I'm here, now look at this, even both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Boy, you're talking about a rough spot. He was seeing God's grace while he was in a jail cell? He sure was. He was seeing the gospel on the move. Some of us have pity parties when we get in places we don't want to be, not, jo not Paul. Why? Because Jesus was very real to him. What life does to you depends on what life finds within you. Is God's grace very real to you today? Then you can have joy like Paul did here, even in the midst of a difficult circumstance in your life. That is the gospel moving in your life so it can move through your life. If you're so self-consumed with who you are and what's going on in your life, which Paul very rarely in any of his prayers does Paul pray about personal needs. But we live in a society today that's consumed with me, 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 me. And Lord, help us not to buy into that self-centered mentality. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ flowing in and through our lives for the glory of God. We are so self-consumed, we have blocked the gospel from flowing through our lives. Because God, it's all about me. Sounds like a country song. In fact, it is a country song. And we won't go there. But country songs reflect what people are thinking. They're the poets of our day. Not just country, but pop and rock and all kind of music. They reflect where we live and what we think. They reflect our world's way of thinking. And we got to have a new way of thinking if we're going to let the gospel be on the move in our lives. we got to say, God, change me. So I'm not self-centered and I'm Christ-centered. I want to be you-centered, God, not me-centered. Me-centered gets me nowhere. Paul was sitting here in a prison cell and all he cared about was that the gospel would go forth. The gospel. We had a young couple here at our church this last Wednesday night. Some of you never come to church on Wednesday night. I've got the handout right here in front of me. I sat right there and I listened to Eric 
and Jeanette Gusselman talk about being moved off of the mission field they are on because for some national security issues, they had to move. They had to leave everything they had. And God was calling them and is calling them to a new mission field in Italy. And they shared their heart. After church, I asked my wife, I said, what impressed you? And Teresa said, when, when Jeanette shared, the wife, she said, just pray that we can find a place to live and a good school for our kids. And I said, God help us. We as a church, we want to applaud people that go across the world and do missions. And we should, and we should do more of it. But we won't even go across the street and tell our neighbors. And the reason we don't is because God's gospel is not real to us in our hearts and in our lives. And it's not flowing through us. Because when it's flowing through you and it's in you, it just spews out all over everything. You can't keep it. It just spews out. And so they wanted to talk about the grace of God and God's grace. And he said, you're partakers of me of the grace. This is the fellowship of the gospel. The common things that we share in common. The grace of joy that had been talked about in this. The grace of giving. You talking about a giving church? Read over sometime in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 about this church in Macedonia. These Christians in Macedonia, they had nothing. They were the richest poor church in town. I just got through teaching a life group lesson on that. The church at Smyrna is described that way in Revelation chapter 2. They had none of the materialistic things that we all have and we enjoy. But God said, you're rich. And the Bible says the reason they were so rich is because they gave themselves first to the Lord. And out of their poverty in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, that's two chapters that we need to just put a big entitlement over those two chapters, the grace of giving. We don't give because we have to. We give because we want to. It's a pleasure to give for God, to support the work of God. It's a joy to give the work. The widow who gave, she gave of herself and Jesus commended her as giving more than any of the rest. And all she gave was a little bit. It's not the amount, it's the heart. It's the heart. And so they were giving and the grace was flowing in and through their life. The grace of suffering, the grace of sacrifice. And then he goes on to talk about not just the grace and that's the fellowship of the grace of God that's very real in our life and the flow of God's grace. But then we see the love of God. Now, these are two big messages that I just don't have time to finish today. We could talk for weeks about the grace of God and the love of God. But I want to whet your appetite. Because he says in verse 8, For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Man, with the affection of Christ Jesus, this word affection is tied to our emotions. I really love you guys. And when you come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, there is a love. Jesus said, you will know my disciples by the way they love one another. Unfortunately, the devil distracts us and sometimes we don't like each other. We fuss with one another. We criticize one another. We gossip about one another. We slander about one another. And God says, how dare you? You're not letting the grace of God and the love of God flow in and through your life when you're doing that. Learn to get along. This book is about unity. Even this letter, in chapter 4 of this letter, Paul calls out two ladies who were in an argument. And he calls them by name. How would you like to be one of those ladies? Yadida and Synthecti are their names. And he told one of his pastors, his dear yoke fellow, help those ladies get along. And we need to help one another get along and love one another the way God wants us to love one another. 
So you see this wonderful fellowship of the gospel. He says, I won't, and this is my prayer in verse nine. I love this prayer. It ought to be every pastor's prayer. It ought to be every one of our prayers. He says, it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment. Some of you love okay. You're on a beginner's level, one-on-one love of Jesus Christ. You know God loves you and hopefully you love him. Now it's time for that love to go to the next level. Don't ever let your love be stagnant or stale. Your love is to be a growing love. There is nothing this world has ever experienced like the love of our God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him, to him he gives the gift of eternal life. Who else has ever loved you enough to die for you? Some might, but few have. God's love is amazing, but he wants your love to be a discerning love, a growing love. And he says that with knowledge and understanding and discernment. So you've got to grow according to biblical truth. And some of us are loving stuff that God says, hey, hold on there. See, there's a kind of love that God hates. He says he hates evil. And he tells us straight up in 1 John chapter 2, love not the world. You get it? Did you hear it? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, then the love of the Father is just not in him. I think many of our American churches and Christians today are loving the world more than we're loving Jesus. And therefore, we've hindered the gospel from flowing through us. We love our Facebook status. We love what we're doing. We love our entertainment. We love our leisures. And it's okay to take a break every now and then. You know that. Jesus rested occasionally. Hopefully, I'll go on vacation someday soon. But the reality of it is when all you are is vacation, there's a big problem. Because God says there's a work for us to do. And there's a will for us to obey. And God wants us to let the gospel flow in and through our lives. And so he says, I want you to be filled with this love so much so that you may approve what is excellent. Now he's challenging us at that point. I, want you to, I don't want you to settle on good things for your life. I want you to learn to focus on the best things. Some of us are missing God's best for our life because we're having too much fun with the good stuff that's all around us. I want your love to be a discerning love. I want it to be a love full of knowledge and truth. And I want it to be a growing love. And so we see that the gospel flows through the fellowship. Now we love a little, but guys, we need to set the woods on fire. We need to learn to love a lot more. I'm thankful that for this group of youth. I've kind of observed them a little bit from the distance this week, some of them. They're not all there, but Michael and David took a bunch of them down to some camps a couple of weeks ago. Me and my wife were sitting in the corner of a restaurant this last Wednesday night after church, and here came one car, another car, another car, another car. And before long, they had filled up almost that whole restaurant. And they went out on the patio, and when me and Teresa left, there was a beautiful picture of this long table. And all of these youth were sitting there together. And they just got back from camp a couple of weeks ago. You want me to interpret that for you? Them kids got closer to Jesus, and it drew them closer to one another. The closer you are to Jesus, the more you will value your brothers and sisters in Christ. The more you'll call and check up on them. The more you'll want to hang out with them. Because that's what it looks like for love to abound. 
for love to abound. And then in my final point this morning, we see not only the fellowship of the gospel, but we see the furtherance of the gospel. And I'll be very brief with this. In verse 12, I want you to know, brethren, that what has happened, that's where I started. Now we've come full circle. What has happened to me has happened to advance the gospel. Now what had happened to him was he was thrown in jail again for preaching the gospel. But I want to give you two points in this passage to help you understand the furtherance of the gospel advancing during difficult days. The furtherance of the gospel also advances at times in unusual ways. Difficult days and unusual ways. So don't think everything has to be squeaky clean in your life and in our world for the gospel to advance. In fact, it's usually just the polar opposite. It's out of the ashes that God will bring beauty. It's out of tragedy that God will bring triumph. It's out of the difficult stuff, those moments that you can't stand and you wish weren't what they are, that God will show up and show out and he'll get glory for it. And he'll pronounce himself through your life. And so Paul was sitting here. It's happened to advance the gospel, so it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard. You know what Paul's saying here? All these guys that Rome have been chained to my hand are now hearing the gospel. The whole imperial guard. How would you like to have been chained to the apostle Paul? That's worse than going to eat lunch with me. Okay? Because of those who know me, if there's one thing I'd rather do than eat, and I know it don't look like it, is talk. <laughs> now, Paul loved to share the gospel message, but he talked most the way we need to. He talked a whole lot about Jesus Christ. I'm sitting here, I'm chained to these guards, and they're getting to hear it, so praise God. The gospel's advancing. All these Roman soldiers are hearing it. Guess what they're doing? They're going back and telling their families, even in my prison experience. And then he said, and most of them in verse 14, the brothers, they have become a lot more confident in the Lord because I'm in jail, I'm in prison. And they're now much more bold to speak the gospel. Folks, our pastor has gone through a, a tragic situation with this heart situation. We ought to be much more bold to preach the gospel because he's not able to right now. That's what this verse is talking about. You can't let your pastors and spiritual leaders do all the gospel sharing that God wants this church to share. If we, that's all that's happening, we're failing. God calls us to motivate you, to remind you, to teach you, to train you. Why? So according to Ephesians, so you as the members can go do the work of the ministry. And we're one of you. And we're in this, we're in this gospel advancement with you. We're soldiers together. But you shouldn't just sit around and asphyxiate on the fact, and you need to pray for Brother Don, and we want him back, and he'll be back. I know Brother Don. He's like the energizing bunny. You know that. He just keeps on going until God gets ready. And that's true for all of us. Any of us can have a difficult moment in our lives. But when difficult things happen, it should cause the fellowship of believers to rally around them and say, let's do this. Let's pick up the slack. Let's serve the Lord together. Let's make the gospel go forward. They were much more bold to speak the word because Paul was unable to at that moment. And then he said, I had friends and foes. He said, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others do it from goodwill. The latter out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former make Christ preach Christ proclaim him out of selfish ambition now man this is a tough passage to interpret he said I got some people here who are really just out preaching the gospel to make life harder for me and I want to just pass over that but the reality of it is there's jealousy there's selfishness there's pride there's ego even in most of our churches if we would be gut honest We'd say, that stuff's in my life, Brother Mike, more than it should be. I get jealous when someone else 
gets a little recognition. I get jealous when I see people singing and teaching and preaching and working in the food pantry ministry because I don't know what I can do. Well, there's a lot any of us can do. Just start doing something, amen? And God will show you what you can do. I promise you, he'll reveal it to you. But don't be passive. Be very intentional and start serving the Lord. Call up here. We'll help you. We'll equip you. But don't get jealous of others who are doing just because you can't do. And don't be making a, a big to-do of it. These folks were preaching Christ. But he said the good ones at the end of verse 15 and 16, the others are doing it good out of goodwill. And the latter do it out of love. That's what he's talking about, love and goodwill. So what God's really saying to you and me here, what is your motivation for ministry? What's motivating you? Self-recognition or the honor and glory of Jesus Christ? It's a lot to take in. But here's Paul's final word. What then? Only that in every way, rather than pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. All he really cared about, he didn't care if there were phony balonies out there trying to make life harder on him. He didn't take after them to avenge them or get back at them. He didn't even complain. He said, big woo. They're trying to make it more difficult on me. Paul knew no one could touch him because he was in the Lord Jesus Christ's hand. No one can pluck you out of his hand. Don't be asphyxiating on the naysayers, the people who are negative. Let them go. Don't even get mad about it. Just keep doing what God wants you to do. And you'll be advancing the gospel. Let's stand together and I'm going to have a word of prayer with you. At the end of this prayer, me and some of the other pastors will be here in the altar to receive you if God is laying a spiritual decision on your heart today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this gospel message and we thank you for the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. There's nothing, Lord, in our life that's more significant than the gospel and how you've saved us and how you continue to save us each and every day from ourselves, from our sin. And Lord, you want to sanctify us and we thank you for that. Lord, help us to be aware of how the gospel moves in our life and through our lives for your name's sake. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Central. We as a church are committed to connecting people to Jesus Christ. You can help us do that today by giving at conwaycentralchurch.org give. Join us at 3333 Dave Ward Drive as we worship together. If you have a need, contact one of our pastors at 501-450-7472. Thank you again for joining us today at Central.